What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to a new show here, here on the Night to Horror. I like to call the Director's Cut. We're going to be sitting down with some filmmakers and talking about their vision as far as their projects go. First and foremost, the first episode, I'd like to uh, proudly introduce a good friend of mine. This is Noah. And Noah has been uh, directing films for... Uh, how long have you been directing films now? About a couple years now, right? You got, And you've been doing cinematography and whatnot over the years. Yeah. And editing and all that Dude. stuff. Like six years, six or seven years now. Dude, it's, yeah. it's wild how fast it goes. Yeah, it's Man. been awesome. Uh, today we're going to break down his uh, his three films that are out now that you can go see on YouTube. I uh, highly suggest them. All horror films, all great. And uh, even more fun, they all tie into each other somehow. We're going to break that very uh, segment down with you, with the, the man, the mastermind behind the projects. Uh, let's start off with, with the debut film, Can't Sleep, man. I mean... We go into this one, and it, it is definitely uh, an interesting one. Talk to us a little bit about um, what the inspiration was to make it, and we'll break down a few scenes of this, uh, this beautiful, beautiful first film. So with Can't Sleep, it, it's wild, because this is when, right when I got out of high school, I graduated in 2017, and I had this idea, because back in the day, like, I kept, like, waking up at night. I was a really light sleeper. I was like, dude, I, I cannot get sleep. And I remember my mom, she provided me a white nose machine. And I was like, D this this white noise machine was like terrifying at first because with the whole sixth sense thing where you like, if you lose one of those, you kind of feel insecure. So like, instead of me falling asleep, I kept like staying up at night and I was like, oh my God, like this is terrifying. Like, I can't imagine if things were walking around while I'm sleeping, just not hearing anything. So I came up with this idea. I was like, you know, maybe if I can use that and create a story behind it, maybe it could work as a short film. And I remember when I was writing this idea, I was still learning. I was going into like film school and like trying to figure out how to like be a script writer and like direct films and stuff. I was kind of all over the place. Um, but I had a friend that was doing actor reels back in the day and he, you know, was like motivating himself to continue to go and be a director in the future. So I was like, you know what, let me reach out to him and see if he can help me like shoot my first film. Reached out to him and he was like, yeah, man, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's go shoot this thing. And when we first, shot it i'm not gonna lie i was so nervous like directing actors and actresses because since i was amateur i didn't really know like what to do and and one thing that helped me the most was like being able to connect with my crew and they all i would show them all horror films that i was inspired by to make this film and one of the main films was insidious from james wan like something about that inspired me the most with like the music aspect of it and like the way that it's shot and like how it makes you feel, you feel uncomfortable. And that's right. how I felt when I was, you know, using this white noise machine. So it, it definitely helped a lot to show them because I'm more of a visual explainer and learner. Like I like to show people like, this is what I'm visioning. You yeah. know, here's a reference to this scene that I'm like, I want to do something like that. And with Can't Sleep, it was definitely the, the baby of like my universe that I'm building. And it, I, it's so special to me. You know, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of things I would like to improve, but I will always value the way that it was built at the end. And I think there was something that we t discussed earlier where there was like an audio issue to it. Right. And I remember when I was released, like I was about to release it and I was so nervous. I was like, like in the back of my head, I'm like, will it do good? Like, will people focus on the bigger picture or will they, will they just say like, Oh, the audio sucked like this, this film crap or whatever. <laughs> and thankfully I, I went with my gut and i released it and surprisingly it blew up which really helped my mindset on just being a director because there are a lot of people that i've spoken to uh since i released this film and they've said like oh you know i want to do films i have a lot of cool ideas like what do i do and i never thought i'd be that person that people would come to me being like hey because i was always that person to go to them right. and it, it's just crazy because it's like i inspired people to want to direct their own films whether they're horror or not it's like they still were inspired by it and it, it makes me super happy because that's like kind of the idea that i was going with with this first film and being able to inspire others to do the same thing because you don't need to be you know some big guy to be able to direct a film and have people enjoy it you know right so with this film there there were a lot of 
like challenges that I, I, you know, talked to you about a little bit and, and I wanted to kind of like go over them with a couple of these scenes in this film that we were able to overcome these challenges and make it work somehow. Yeah. And I know one of them was definitely the, the, I think we could talk about, um, maybe we can go with the one take first. One takes for me in, in, in film, I have to admit one takes for me are just are always beautiful shots. Um, mm-hmm. when you see a one take in a film, you, you just kind of lose your shit, especially if it's well put together uh, and whatnot. I, I would say the most famous one in, in recent years was probably anything you saw in Daredevil. Um, you know, oh, Daredevil yeah. doing their one shots and whatnot. And then uh, another another good one, I thought, in my opinion, too, was uh, Halloween 2018 when they're following Michael Myers mm-hmm. in the backyard into the house and whatnot. Uh, one yeah. shots are just fun uh, shots to do. And uh, I've always wondered the... Uh, the amount of frustration it probably goes through to 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 want to do it perfectly. How many takes? So before we go into the scene, uh, set it up a little bit. Like, what are we about to watch, and uh, how long did it take you guys overall to to, to accomplish this one take? Okay, so what we're about to watch is supposed to be towards the end of the film, like the kind of the finale. Um, there is some spoilers that I'm about to talk about. So if you haven't seen this film, please watch now before I go over this because it will definitely ruin like everything building up. But this is right after the the son, which his name is Tim. He just got murdered by a cult that is breaking into their house. And basically what they're doing is they're taking a soul, like a pure soul, to bring in a demonic entity to basically wipe out half the population, pull some like Thanos stuff. Like it, it, there's a whole backstory about that. But during this whole segment, the mom, which her name is Sarah, she's unaware of this because of the white noise machine blocking that sense, you know, of not hearing the kid struggling and like gasping for air while he gets, he gets choked to death. It's pretty graphic, but um, it, it's like, <laughs> it's definitely funny. Cause um, I just want to talk about this real quick. When we shot this scene, I, I told, I told the the kid's name. I think his name was Bray. I, I forgot his name. I only remember him as Tim. But uh, I told Bray, I was like, hey, hey, man, um, this is the scene where you die. And he seems so excited. He's like, oh, my God, yeah. I'm like, let's go. And I told him he hasn't seen the guy that chokes him. And he forgot that he's getting choked to death. He thought he just gets, like, stabbed. So I told him, I was like, okay, um, there's a guy that's going to come in. He wears, He's wearing, like, this, like, this like little mask that's supposed to look like an alien. Um, there's a whole thing where it's like a, a hoax and shit like that. But um, he's gonna come in and he's gonna strangle you to death in, in the bed. And his face when he saw the guy, because it's like some tall six foot three guy. He just comes in, hey man, how you doing? Like firm handshake. And the kid's <laughs> scrawny. He's like a little kid. He's like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> he was so nervous, but it was it it, it really sold the scene, right? Um, because obviously he was like getting strangled but he he really played it really well and it kind of concerned me a little bit i was like it seems like he was a little too comfortable with that so i was like why is he like really good at just getting strangled but then i was like <laughs> okay this guy's just i don't know it's weird but um basically tim gets murdered before the scene happens and when the scene is going on throughout the film there is a artist named naya gray that basically is releasing an art piece and when the film is going on, you start to hear more news about the, this art piece, like a countdown going on. So this is the same night that the art piece is being released. And she has a connection with these cult members. She's actually the leader that's setting up the whole plan. So it's like a mislead where the audience doesn't know that she's involved with this this whole like breaking in and murdering like a kid and like setting up a ritual and stuff like that. Right. So when this is happening, the cult members are coming in. But sarah is watching on the news the reveal of this picture or this like painting and the cool thing about this um inside the painting and we'll kind of go over this when we, when we show the scene inside the painting there's a symbol and the symbol is the same symbol that the cult members use but it's blending into the artwork and it's kind of like that sign off that it's like they're all connected in their own way and they're all working together to bring in this creature this demonic creature there's more to the story that i don't really want to go too in depth with but um, that's what we're about to watch right now. It's the one take that we shot where we show them coming into the house. And we get to follow Sarah going from the living room where she's watching the uh, the um, news report and like the, the art piece. Yeah. 
and she's going through the house like kind of just getting ready to go to bed and she goes in the bathroom like wash her face and while this is happening um we see naya gray's like colt like outfit going through on the outside going into the house and it's all in the background unaware and it's just it's it's awesome but i, I would love to show that right now if you guys want to take a look at it all right, so we're gonna we're gonna show this clip right now. Uh, we're gonna be kind of doing a little. We'll do a little. We'll do a little commentary over it as well. So we'll be on the screens uh, reacting to it as well. Um, but we're gonna show this clip for you guys uh, of of Noah's film "Can't Sleep," uh, the one take uh, scene, and I'm super excited because you know me and my one take. So uh, let's go ahead and get yeah. a countdown going in three, two, and one. All right. Are you watching the one at 1657? Yeah. All right. right There's the art piece right there. The piece is called The Awakening. It's pretty wild, man. Everything is so well orchestrated. It really is. I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty wild how we were able to pull this off. Cause <laughs> there were a lot of times where we were like, oh, how is this gonna work with the reflection of the camera? Yeah. So let's go back real quick just to kind of break it down. I, I definitely want to go over um, the start of it where she's, you know, watching. It, she's watching the. The news report, everything seems fine. But did you notice something in the background while that was I did. Someone passed by in the background. I caught that immediately. Yeah. So when we shot that, it's basically a stunt double that's supposed to be the same girl that walks into the hallway. That's Nia Gray's character. So this is actually really funny. When we shot this scene, um, we were like, okay, how are we going to make it? How are we going to get her to go from the outside to start off? and get all the way into the hallway in just like three seconds. Like, how are we going to do that? So when we were shooting it, I reached out to a friend that looked very similar to uh, Nia Gray, like Nia Gray's character. And I was like, hey, this is really last minute, but would you be interested to be a background actor in my film, like my first film? And she's like, yeah, I'll come by. So we got, we came by, I told her just, hey, we're going to use a long, like a long white shirt that her boyfriend had or something or like i need you to put your hair in front of you and just like stand in this corner perfectly in this corner and i'll cue you we had a walkie talkie we're like all right we're gonna cue you when this is happening because when we shot this this scene we had no audio we took out audio because we needed to choreograph the scene of like go one two three and those points were when she does certain actions so when our when the news reporter in the in like the scene that you're watching when he talks about the awakening when that, that line went off, that was right. when we said our one. That was our one. And that was supposed to motion the girl in the background to move out of frame to get the audience to be focused on the background. But while the foreground's happening, she's turning off the TV. She's moving into the living room, going into the kitchen bar area. And when that's happening, we had our cue to have the camera off to turn. I don't know if you notice this, but he turned down. There's an ND filter that basically makes it so he can take out reflections right. but the thing is when he does that he loses exposure so at let me tell you when we start to he quickly does it and it works so well when she's cleaning you know she puts her plate away she walks past the oven area which is like kind of like blacked out but you see the reflection of the lights in the background at 17 minutes and 43 yeah. seconds but you don't see the camera operator like it's it's super faint and we what we did is we right when the scene happened we turned on the nd filter so it's like perfectly timed where he wasn't shown when he walked past that reflection we turned it back up right when he got past so Perfect. it was all super technical and like choreographed but i'm just it, it, the fact that we were able to do this and like it, i think we did it this is the first take actually and then we did two other takes for safety but when we watched it over on the com and like the cam i was like dude I think we got it on our first try. And also another thing too that I wanted to point out, at 17 minutes and 58 seconds, the window in the in the bathroom is open and it's been closed the entire film. And yeah. that's how she got into the house. 
Which makes sense is why she comes down the hallway because then people are going to be like, well, she's supernatural or something. It's like, no, fool. She's just yeah, going right. to climb through windows. Yeah, right. <laughs> she's she's small. She's like, I think she's five foot four, dude. She is. Oh, then yeah, she's small. getting through that window. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Me, on the other scene, hand, not getting through that window. You just like, you just go right through the door. Like, I'll just hey, take, I'm, I'm going to the back kid. door and be like, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> You're like six foot four coming in. Dude, I. I mean I that if if I was gonna be a serial yeah. killer, I'd be the asshole serial killer. Be like, what's going on? Who's ready to die tonight? You're, you're, you're like, I you ain't going nowhere, man. Yeah. I, I got you surrounded. You just pull him in the corner, and that's it. Man, I mean, it's over. that's like Jason, like Jason and like Michael Myers. Like Michael Myers is like six foot two, right? Isn't he like yeah. up there on the six scale? Six two, six okay. one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and then Jason is Jason's taller, right? Am I? Is he there might be, or he that? might be around the same height. It depends on the actor okay. who played them too. All tall guys though. They're all tall yeah. guys. Those are like the big dogs, man. They don't you know, they can walk and they'll still get you. They'll yeah. still get you. All right. We are just seconds away from the reveal. Countdown. Three, two, one. Whoa. That's incredible. Such a talented young lady. It's very reminiscent of Rorschach art. Very, very interesting. It looks like Niagara is calling this piece the awakening. <laughs> Still get you like for these guys here you know they're a cult they're you know just normal human beings they don't got any like powers or whatever so they have to be more stealthy with it and the cool thing is throughout the film they start to notice that this white noise machine is is like blocking out the sounds that they're making when they're sneaking in so it definitely right. uses they use it as an advantage to break in and murder him and th you know there's a lot of stuff i could talk about this white noise machine like how the demonic entity that they were trying to bring in was communicating through the white noise machine in this next scene that uh, we'll talk about right now, which is at 11 minutes and 53 seconds. This scene is one of my favorite suspenseful jump scare scenes that I've ever done in any of the films I've, I've directed. This is by far my favorite one because something about the way that it was set up, it just hit right. Like when I when I was envisioning, I was like, dude, if we can have the buildup just enough where it, it's executed with that scare, right? I, I will I will like flip out because I, I was kind of doubting myself during this first you know film that I directed I was like oh you know I'm not I don't know if I can do it but we tried it you know and surprisingly it worked out really well and I would love to show this scene um, it, we call it we call it's like we used to have a name for it. I forgot what the name was called but um this is like Tim's scene like Tim's like scare scene there it is but um yeah the little boy okay uh, another thing before we get into the scene too because uh, you had mentioned it. How nervous was it for you to uh, do the one thing that we're starting to see in horror movies now more often, but it's been, it was kind of one of those things that you never really saw, which was kill off the kid. How hard was it to, how hard was it to make the decision to kill off the kid? <laughs> I, you know, what's funny. Um, it didn't take a lot of time to discuss that. It was very quick. I remember, you know, when I pitched this to my, my producer, I was like, Hey man, just want to let you know the kid dies. And that was like one of the first things I said. And he looked at me because he's pretty familiar with the horror, you know, genre. He knows like how things roll out with kid getting getting killed. Like it's very rare. It's yeah. very rare, depending on the film. He looked at me and he's like, Tell me more. Tell me more. I want to know more. And and I went into that and he's like, All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's find the right kid actor. And thankfully, this guy. This kid, you know, obviously forgot that he was going to get killed by being strangled, but he was so motivated to do it and everyone was on board with it. And I was like, I kind of looked for a second. I remember right before we shot it, we had a break and I looked at everyone and I was like, like, is that, is not, is everyone cool with this? Like just a kid good. getting strangled to death and everyone's like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go All for right. it. Um, and you know, I didn't get any, I, I'm actually really surprised a lot of the comments 
were not targeted towards that. Like I thought that I was going to get some hate for it. And they're like, well, dude, I love that scene. I was like, what? You the? know, what's funny is, you know, we're talking about it too now. And, and that's another reason why I like, I, I had the idea to do a show like this was, you know, in the mm. sense of it's good to get the, the, the info from the person who was there from start to finish, you know, and, 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 to really break down and that's always been one of my things you know watching especially over the internet and stuff is all these interviews with directors and stuff of how they've accomplished uh certain shots or what it was like to to film with certain people and stuff and that's why for me I've, i like i said you've been seeing it lately in movies kids been dying halloween 2018 i was like michael just killed a kid oh. i was like what just happened dude yeah the new one halloween ends it, it yeah. is a a lot of people do not like that film but the opening scene I know it wasn't Michael Myers, but oh my God, like that was, I was not expecting that. And I kind of like the difference. I like the change, you know, this was something that we talked about earlier on where I was like, you know, with my films, I like to change it up a bit. I don't like to go with like the same old formula, you know, there's, there's some great things about it. Don't get me wrong. They work, but it's like, I love to switch it up because people, you know, the audience, they watch the same thing just recycled sometimes yeah. there's some films that i've seen that i'm like oh it's this is just like you know this movie just like scream like i i swear i've seen this before yeah. um and i really wanted to switch it up but yeah dude a kid getting killed is uh and that's my first film that i directed it definitely sets a bar of like sets oh, God, the tone right there it's like all right this yeah. guy's not messing <laughs> yeah. up he's not messing around we got some we got some work we're gonna have ahead of us let's see what happens dude definitely but yeah uh, uh, all right let's let's see tim's big scare. scene this is this is uh, a, a good jump scare the jump scare and then yeah. a little bit afterwards i'm gonna talk we'll talk a little bit about the art of the jump scare because uh the art of the jump scare to me has always been something memorable to, to remember in all horror movies thus far ever made so let's uh definitely. let's take a look at, at noah's jump scare and then we'll talk a little bit about the art of the jump scare all right You know what's what's a, what's a good setup that I'm seeing right now with this is the, uh, mm. the very ominous shots of, of like the house, the fan, and you got yeah. the clock, the little you know, weird the lights, light. the room. So one thing, one thing here. Well, look at the look at the clock. It yeah. was nine nine p.m. Look at it now. Yeah. That's too big. That's literally everyone who says five more minutes in the morning, and then that happens. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So in reality, it's like you were throwing in an inside joke to everyone who doesn't want to get up for work on a Monday. For real, that's that's exactly what I was targeting. The uh, the quickness of the shots, and then that right there, dude. That's just terrible. <laughs> and then the white. Noise the and then he just goes right back to bed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, that was dude. That scene what a was shot. actually one of the. One of the first the first scenes that we we shot in this film and the transition to to the vacuum was something I really wanted to do with the whiteness machine because they have the same like hum. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a great transition. But yeah, no, that's the that's one of my favorite scenes, like jump scare scenes that I've ever, you know, directed and, and, and shot. Um, the reason why I picked this one is because this was the first time doing a scare. Um, you know, I've worked on a couple films in the past before I was able to direct this film that I've worked on some jump scare scenes and I understood like the basics of like, obviously it needs to be quiet to build up. There needs to be some sort of like low, like hum or vibration to kind of make you feel like that tense Yeah. and then the impact. But the thing is the one thing that I think we're all aware of, you're more terrified of the unknown then when you actually see what it is, it's yeah. like a relief, you know? And I love that energy. That's the reason why I direct horror films. I think being able to control people's emotions just by shooting something and making them feel uneasy because in the back of their head, they're like, they're picturing things mm-hmm. of like, oh, what what is this thing going to be? What is it going to yep. look like? Am I going to get night terrors? So this scene, if you really think about it, it's not a lot. Like we... The way we shot this scene, um, I'll break it down a little bit. We did a little bit of a, a time a time forward, or I forgot what they call it, like the time loop thing, where it starts at one time, all one take, and it transitions to later on in that night, you know, 9 p.m. till 2 a.m. Right. And also another thing I want to point out, too, with this film, 
And it it does a lot with the end credits because all my end credits are special. They all have little information and detail. Take a look at the times because they also document when they're doing their sacrificings and they're the similar times of when he's experiencing these traumatic events. Huh. So there's a lot of connections going on there that are oh, yeah. not, I don't like to spoon feed things. I like people to kind of figure it out. It's like a mystery, you know? So um, when the scene's happening, oh, there's another thing I want to talk about too. But in this scene, he, you know, he's sleeping, whatever. The white noise starts to spaz out. And that's actually the demon trying to communicate with the cult members saying that, the solution to bring him into this world is to kill a pure soul. And that was their whole idea of like trying to figure out what they need to do. So they would do sacrifices. They wouldn't work because the pure soul was not pure enough. It was, it was corrupted people that were like, they've been aged. They, they're not pure enough to be able to break the line between, you know, the whatever demented world and reality or whatever. So finding a fresh soul was kind of the whole objective in the background, but in the, very beginning of this film you don't know that you just see them kind of doing their thing and then the credits kind of tell the other side of the story so it's very fascinating the way that that's all like put together but um for the scene you know it's a very simple scene like i said before we split the cuts up a little bit to build some some suspense with pov shots right um you hear the sound of someone running up and sitting on the edge of the bed right i don't know if you noticed but on the edge of the bed you see like an imprint of someone sitting there like something yeah. It, it's it's at like 12 minutes and 33 seconds um goes to pov mode he looks over at that imprint and he hears the sound of this thing kind of going into the attic the thumps and it's obviously it's like an entity that's can you know like a demonic entity that can go wherever or whatever and it only has enough power to be invisible but still have a like an energy like presence to be able to form himself in like sheets and whatnot and in this scene, the demon's behind him, and he's under some bed sheets. And when we shot that, it was <laughs> – it didn't really work out at first. It looked really weird at first. It looked like – like, it just looked like a normal person at first. So we were like, okay, we need to, like, stick out the horns a little bit because the demon has, like, these horns that kind of stick out. Right. And when we put the sheets over it, you couldn't see it. It just looked like a normal figure. <laughs> so we, we used some, like – I think it was toilet paper or, like, the – the holes from toilet papers and we kind of stuck it on my friend and he he looked so goofy under the sheets but um i was telling him i was like hey man you know we're gonna choreograph this moment i need you to just drop just fall flat as fast as you can and i'm gonna have tim turn his head immediately after like super super fast right and thankfully after like i think it was five tries we got this shot here and it was just timed out so well where you can see this the demon's creature's name is Yima. Um, he gets brought up a lot in the storyline. But Yima is slowly getting closer and closer in the background, and then he just drops. Right. And it's it's supposed to be that, you know, formula jump scare that's very typical for most films, where it's right. kind of like the tease. But yeah. I did that for a reason, because I, I really wanted to spice it up with, like, this creature is still in the background. You're unaware of it now that you've lost the sound. You know, right. you've lost... The, the vision of where he may be but it's like that's why this scene is just so special because i'm like we were able to make it work well you know, it could have been weird you know you think of the art of the jump scare man and and it's been around since since the dawn of horror you know it's it's something that's that's yeah. you know it, it's what drives the audience and gives them that adrenaline rush mid movie you know what i mean to keep them kind of on edge on seat as to what's going on situational wise uh normally you get them throughout the you get them spaced out in the beginning and towards the end of movie or towards the middle of movies to kind of build up what uh our our um our pretty much uh our heroes are going through you know what i mean so it's exactly. one of those things where um you know you, you think of so many over the years you know you got things like the exorcist that had some good jump scares you know that that's oh. iconic you know all the way to now oh, yeah. insidious and the conjuring which you know are are famous for you know, and the way they tackle their jump scares, you know, a lot of, you know, back in The Exorcist, it was all practical effects and whatnot. And, and they, mm -hmm. to my opinion, that's one of the greatest possession movies ever made to date. I mean, there's... 100%. There's no... Without a doubt. There's no... I mean, Conj don't get me wrong, Conjuring and Insidious are great, but they, st in my opinion, in my eyes, in my opinion, they don't beat The Exorcist because The Exorcist, uh, mm -hmm. they did something in the 70s that was super special. And I, I don't think you can ever recapture that feeling again, but... You know, you look at the you look at the Conjuring and, and a lot of their jump scares. You know, they they base it with, of course, uh, loud music too. 
Um, and, and mm. you know, when you see a lot of that, you, you get like the loud, high pitched music, and then like a demon right there behind somebody or like in front of somebody and stuff, and and whatnot. So, yeah. you know, watching this scene right here, you know, you got to see a lot of those kind of those little pieces Frankenstein together, and kind of just like, all right, mm-hmm. let me let me let me do a Noah jump scare now. Let me let me show you what I can do. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's I mean, actually it was so funny well that you brought up that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's definitely funny that you brought up um, the Conjuring as well, because that was also something that we were inspired by. Uh, in the first Conjuring, there's a scene where the mom's outside and it's super windy, and she's putting up a sheet, and the sheet hits a figure that's standing right there. Right. And we were like, dude, I loved the sheet concept. It's so like, it, it's a practical effect, and obviously they did, you know, post stuff CGI but the stuff, fact yeah. that they used a, a cgi practical but it, it inspired us to do this scene where we use the the sheet as like the the form of the figure because it's you still don't know what it looks like you have right. it in your head of like this thing looks it could be terrifying and the whole build-up works and we did use the uh the music aspect of it from insidious because insidious does a lot with music i think by far it's one of my favorite scores from any of the paranormal films like yeah. horror films that i've ever watched like something about the violin dude like i actually did this was not something we talked about before but um if you have a second i do want to kind of talk about the music real quick because the composer that i work with i've worked with him since this first film i met him through a friend and we clicked instantly like he understood like what i was looking for and he gave me like the things that i was like i didn't think i was going to be able to get from a composer because i was really nervous in the beginning of like, dude, what if this composer guy that I get it doesn't understand how to create a story musically in a horror element? Because a lot of people do dramas, a lot of people do, you know, action films and westerns and stuff. But nobody, the people that do horror films are very unique. Like they, it's a, it's a different tone, you know, like how they use the instruments and how it makes it makes you feel, you know. So I wanted to show you this one scene. Um, it's at five minutes and fifty seconds. Okay, and it's just listen to the music while the scene happens it's it's inspired by insidious you'll know immediately what i'm talking about but uh if you want to give me a countdown i'll play it at the same time as you and then i'll tell you when it ends it's at 550 all right let's do a countdown in three two and one i know this is probably going to pick up in the mic so i do apologize for a little 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 echo but So that yeah. scene right there, the that, music. That, that's some, that's it. some, I mean, even like the way it was shot, that right there yeah. is some insidious inspiration right there. It, it was, it was definitely something that was actually the first thing that the composer sent to me. Um, because when I was looking for composers, there was three that I had on my list and the guy, his name is Chase Hagerman. He's amazing. Like you will definitely see more of his work in the future, but he, you know, I sent it to him. I was like, hey, this is the little scene that we got. You know, I'm in, I'm really inspired by Insidious if you'd be able to get something out of it. And that guy did his homework. he never seen that movie before. He's like, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to do it. And out of all the three guys, they're all great, by the way. But, like, out of all the three, his just stuck out the most. It, it was, like, exactly what I was envisioning. And I got chills when I watched it the first time. I was in my car uh, in call, Or I think, I, yeah, it was my first month in college and i was watching this i was like oh my god like i'm hiring this guy immediately but um i just wanted to discuss that because um it created a great relationship you know like i said we're still working together and we're working on some really big projects now but um it all started from that one scene and that just you know created a whole journey but uh yeah i mean it's definitely wild like a lot of these movies inspire people and like the fact that i'm able to make something out of it and make it my own and have my own fling and like like style to it It, it's it's just incredible and like people enjoy it you know seeing these things they're like oh that's crazy but uh yeah i I wanted to show you that one can't sleep uh really i think is a good i think it was a good way to kick off your 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 storytelling obviously as as that and 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 to kind of see where this story is going to go and everything. I mean, I really, I, I'm really digging, you know, a lot of the, the first film that you made, a lot of the inspirations that you had going into it, a lot of 
concept scenes that you were showing people that you wanted to try to accomplish like this was an inspiration for this like that was an inspiration for that you know and um to see how you pulled it off in such um which i imagine a lot of your films are uh, at the moment right now uh, small budgets and whatnot uh going in oh yeah <laughs> small to no budgets you know that's yeah, literally how, yeah yeah i mean that's Doing how that's how it is whatnot. man small to no budget but you know what I feel like a lot of the times those movies are a lot of the times filmed with love. And so that's why a lot of the times those, those small to no budget films sometimes hit really good. Um, and, you know, I've gotten a chance to, to work on set with you and, and to, to kind of see how you do your things and stuff. And it's it's a vibe. It really is. Yeah. There's, there's, just, there's a lot of there's a lot of fun in between stuff. But then, you know, when it's time to get to oh, business, yeah. everyone gets to business. Dude, that's that's the that's the joy about filmmaking um yeah let's let's talk a little bit was there anything else you wanted to talk about can't sleep Cause can't I know, sleep i mean that was i mean that I mean i i i'm woo. i i was sold when i watched it i remember you actually were 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 explaining things to me that the night of filming our next uh original film coming up uh the devil's got my arms and we were talking yeah. about can't sleep and your kind of overall vision of what you want to see in the future and and other projects that uh mm -hmm. uh that are coming soon um Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say oh, that yeah. at the most they're coming soon <laughs> yeah. uh but the three projects we have right now are kind of things that have been tying in that and uh yeah a good segue into the devil's got my arms What can I talk about the Devil's Got My Heart? Because I actually got to experience to be on set for this one. Um, yeah, I want to know. I want to know what you were thinking. You didn't really know much about me. You just heard no. from a friend, like, "Oh, there's this guy." Like, I want to know what you thought when you went into this, and just the whole, <laughs> the whole like nine yards and whatnot. Uh, this was a lot of fun for me and, and whatnot. I mean, we got so many great experiences and so many uh, uh, great memorable moments that when I watch this short, I'm just like, "This is." This was fun. To do. I, I had a good time. Isn't that? <laughs> and oh, I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I so like I, I, I think it was in between takes. Like we were just kind of BSing and stuff. And like I was talking to you, I'm like, yeah. So I noticed you guys are fucking doing a lot of screaming. I'm like, that's gonna be that's gonna be really cool on film. I was like, how's it holding up with the neighbors though? <laughs> 